Hello, welcome to Gamble. You read a bonus Wednesday episode for you this week as we welcome Sky Sports commentator Seb Hutchinson to give us his take on Nottingham Forest after covering the last two games and seeing them a number of times this season as well. Seb, good to have you with us. How are you doing? Thanks for having me on. Yeah, I'm doing very well indeed. So, um, like I said, you, you commentated on Forest last two games. And you were saying before we recorded, you, you've watched a lot of their other games in prep as well, as well as being a general football fan. Um, what have you made of them this season, especially compared to last season's a, a second season Premier League team now? Well, when I look at Forest, I think what amazes me right now more than last season, there's some very, very good players in that team. Mm. And there are players that clubs further up the league we're after and this is part of the process when you're trying to stay when you're trying to stay in the division and move up the division and establish yourself as a premier league side is when you have when you start being able to purchase players that the big clubs inverted commas are after as well and i when i've watched forest this season I, I look at the team and their performances and i think steve cooper's got a lot of good players at his mm. disposal here and the big issue he has now is choosing a consistent 11 if that's the way he wants to go and it feels like to, if he can do that and that's the biggest i think the biggest issue he has overall is that actually they they have injuries but a lot of clubs have got a bigger injury issue his issue is selecting his best team and deciding who is my best side just to give some consistency to the performances because Every game I've watched before, they've almost blown hot and cold during the 90 minutes. They've had spells where you think, oh, actually, this team, what, what are they worried about going down for? And then 10 minutes later, it's like, oh, OK, well, I see, I see, I see the issues. Did we see that a bit on um, Sunday, do you think? Well, they started so well, that first 30 minutes. But as we got to half time, like you were saying on commentary with Alan Smith, no shots on target for either team. I, I thought leaving Morgan Gibbs White out was a questionable one but I love Steve Cooper and we'll never never criticize him too much um but did we see that that lack of creative spark because there's still the building is some kind of cohesion with all these new signings well this is the thing we're talking about him trying to settle on his best 11 but Morgan Gibbs White is always in that best 11 he's arguably Forrest's most important player and I think he was just looking for a moment to give him a breather and the the style in which he plays He's an all-action player. He covers so much ground. His relentless energy, so eye-catching in that in that respect. And Steve Cooper was looking for a chance. Maybe Brentford at home. I can just rest him for forty-five minutes and see how we go. And actually, the way the game started, I thought, you know, they don't, they'll be fine here. I don't know if that was more about Brentford's approach to the game. And Brentford are a side where sometimes, when they, even when they're not playing badly, you think to yourself. Is this still part of the plan? <laughs> is this still part of... Because they seem, they feel more settled. I know they've struggled for victories this season, but they seem more settled as a club in in, in terms of recruitment and, and an 11. But they've been, they were missing a fair few important players against Forest as well. And that was notable. I did, did feel like they, they lacked a you know, presence up front that could really you know, make it work. In a weird way, Forest's front three felt more Brentford than Brentford's. Mm. You know, that 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 front three unit in Alanga and Hudson Adoy and Awani, those three that felt like a Brentford front three and how they want to play. Um and their front three didn't really perform on the day. So it was down to set pieces and there were some strong defensive performances in the Brentford side as well. And it was almost Forrest just sort of ran out of steam and they they there were impressive elements to it from an attacking point of view. But they didn't, they didn't create much. There wasn't much in terms of, well, there wasn't any attempts on goal in the first half. Yet I came away from the first half thinking they were the better side, which was a strange sort of situation to be in. And let's be frank, it was quite a forgettable game in many ways. <laughs> it yeah. wasn't a great watch. And obviously as a commentator, you, you are trying to make sure, well, try to keep people engaged in the game. But sometimes they can really test you. I've got a commentary question for you later. I'll save that one. Um, <laughs> what do you make of Hudson Adoy and Elanga then? Cooper is really good with young players, a bit of kind of reclamation projects. There's a lot of talent there. At times, I can see why United let Elanga go in terms of end product, but you can also see there's a lot of untapped potential there for both of them, isn't there? I think Manchester United letting him go and Forrest buying him are almost two different discussions in many ways. I think Forrest buying Elanga, terrific signing when you looked at it. 
again, I think with Hudson Adoy because that is the position Forrester in at the moment. They're thinking if we can get, and again, I use it in vertical commas, cast off from from one of the top clubs towards the top of the league. Although questions whether you can put Manchester United in that category at the moment, but in many ways you think, well, this is how we can make it work because these these big clubs they have so much talent on their books, they can't play them all, and this could be a problem down the road for Forest. Of course, they're going to have to let people go who aren't who aren't getting enough game time. That was the case with Hudson Odoi and the case with Elanga, but they're young enough and they have time ahead of them to make something of them, and. I'm sure you'll ask me a bit about Steve Cooper in a second, but I think that link between his time at the FA or with the FA and the way the players he's looking for, especially young players, if he can, will see that over time, I think, bear fruit because he's seen, he knows about young player development and also he's got players in his squad and has had players in his squads who he's worked with at youth level with England. And Hudson Adoy are you know, I watched most of, in fact, I watched all of England under 17's games in the 2017 World Cup. They had a terrific side. They fully deserved to win that competition. And even from game one, I thought it's going to take a lot to beat this team. You know, they're attacking strength with, of course, Phil Foden on the, on the right-hand side. Sancho started the competition on the left. Hudson Odoi was in, in the middle. And then they had Brewster up front, Gomez in the midfield. It looked unstoppable. But Sancho went home early. It was an agreement with Dortmund and Warren Gibbs-White came into the team and it still still worked. And the, the Gibbs-White you see now is, is the same is, is the same player in many ways. The same things you see in him, that infectious enthusiasm, the way he feels he wants to lead a team. It's, it, he's got a captain's way about him, actually, for, for a midfielder in that respect. And and he's the record signing, but yeah, I think he was a fantastic signing and, and he bared fruit for Forrest in many ways. So, yeah, going to hudson Adoy in that competition, he was one of England's best players. And shortly after that, he got in, he was impressing with Chelsea, linked with Bayern. We all know the story and then the injury and everything else. So the question is, can Forrest get that back? Can they get that back from him? And already in the games we've seen, you can see that element of it and a consistency. So the question is, will Stephen, will Steve Cooper not to go too formal within there. Well, Steve Cooper <laughs> decide to give him a run of games and make him feel like he's part of the club and give him that confidence. And maybe him and Gibbs White will create a, a partnership that will be at Forest for a long, long time. It's impossible to know modern football, but you want that. I think supporters want that. They want to know that a player, they feel like a player is going to be there for several years. Mm -hmm. And hopefully that's the case. When you've got two young English players who feel maybe they've missed out or have missed out with their previous clubs, the clubs they came through at, through their academies. They've got similar stories in that respect. Can they put, can they be at Forest for years to come? And I mean, Hudson Doy's goal against Burnley showed the quality that he has. Terrific goal. So when you see a taste of that as a, as a fan, you think, right, we know he has that in his locker. Can we see that week in, week out? Because the key to success in football is consistency. And that's what you're looking for. And that's what Forrest looking for as a team in general. I think the quality is in this team to comfortably, comfortably stay in the Premier League. Yeah. I mean, before we get on to Cooper, that was one of the other things I wanted to discuss because on the podcast, we kind of look at it very much through this Forrest lens and think, I don't, last year was all about staying up. This year, we kind of feel they're better than five or six other teams and they can challenge that kind of 12th place Palace, Fulham, Brentford position. As someone who watches a lot of Premier League football and doesn't have that bias for us, is, is that a fair assessment, do you think? I think to have that ambition for this season is definitely, that's a fair enough to say. I'd say some of those teams you've mentioned, in terms of Fulham and, and Pal particularly Crystal Palace, they're a settled Premier League side in the fact that, I would say this about Palace, they're the sort of team where a lot of other clubs don't pay attention to their score lines. And yet at the weekend, they've won 1-0 somewhere or they've drawn with somebody and mm -hmm. they're picking up points every week. They're rarely a team that you see and think they've what, they've lost 10 games in a row. Where's a win coming from? They had that spell under Vieira last season, which led to him leaving the club. But they had a run of very difficult fixtures in that time. And whether you agree with the decision or not, 
they then had a more friendly run of fixtures towards the back end of the season. A lot more games that maybe weren't on telly as well. And and this is often when we see Palace on telly, you know, they're playing one of the the big clubs at home on a Friday mm. night or a Monday. And I've done a few of those. And even in those games, they've picked up results. I saw them beat Arsenal about, you know, trying to get a year and a half or so ago. They drew with City, they held City in during that that title run at, at the back end of uh, 21-22. So they're a club of capable of that. Now, if you're comparing yourself to Palace and thinking, are Forrester club capable of that? That's going to be the next thing. Possibly, possibly. That's the thing. There's, I can't dismiss that because having seen them, they do have the ability to think, yeah, they could they could nick something from them. And you think of the, the away games they've had this season. Narrow defeat at Arsenal, narrow defeat at Manchester United. And then the way the City game went in the second half, who knows? On another day, there was a bit of regret about that in the second half. That You know, a chance to, to, to get something from the Etihad. So, and I haven't forgotten about the win at Chelsea, by the way. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I, I think that's a fair enough assessment to think that you can match yourself with those clubs. And I did think it before the Brentford game, it felt like a really important match because Brentford, as I said before, they they haven't had the best start to the season. And I think Forrest as a club are looking at a club like Brentford and thinking, we can push beyond them. Mm. We can push beyond them. And that's the target for Forrest now. It feels like, I felt like more optimism around the club than there was Brentford before that game. Now, after the game, it's a bit muddled, a bit because, you know, second half and everything else. But I, I you know, I, I, I think they, uh, and the thing about it, they've been away for so long for us, been away for so long from the, from the top flight, that there are a lot of supporters in the league that are happy that they're there, that mm. they're around. It feels, especially supporters of a certain age as well, they're like, oh, it feels right that they're in the top division. Of course, there'll be some neighbours of yours that will disagree with that. But that they have that feel about them and the ground has that feel about it as well. So I'm giving this long-winded answer basically to give you the point that, yes, to feel that way is fully justified. Whether it's going to happen is another matter because we know how muddled the Premier League has get. But they shouldn't feel like they should be looking over their shoulder this season. When I look at the players at their disposal and what they can produce and what they've produced already this season, you don't feel like they're a club that are going to go on a six, seven game losing streak. And there are a few teams in the league that, that could do that. And, mm. and, and some are, you know, are pretty close to doing that already. So I, I'd feel confident if I was a Forest fan, let's say that. I just want to pick up on two things you said there then about Palace. And I think you're spot on. I, I always believe that you can play teams at the right time and we've got them this weekend. I just wonder, is this weekend a good time to play them? Obviously, Edward's injured, Zaha's gone, Elise's injured, but now you add Eze into that list, who's such a good player, and he's their talisman, like Madison, like Gibbs White, like Fernandez, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If Forest are going to go there, they can go there with some confidence, you think? Oh, they'll go there with confidence. I think every club should go to Palace with confidence, of course, but hmm. I think with Crystal Palace, they are just a team. When And I've done so many of their games in recent years, and they always look quite solid defensively. That's what that's what I've noticed. They're quite tough to to break down. Their midfield, particularly at the moment, looks quite strong. Doesn't look like it's going to be bullied too much. And they've got that guile in forward areas. Now, of course, that that the big part of that guile is missing this weekend, which mm. is a big bonus for Forest, of course, and a big loss for Palace. And their their squad depth is their big issue. And I don't know if it's wrong to say it's slightly intentional that their squad is made up of that. A very strong first eleven, and maybe some younger players mixed with some experienced players on the bench, but not that depth in terms of you thinking they could push for Europe. They are just their principal focus is stay in the Premier League for Palace every season. I don't think the club thinks we're pushing for Europe. I don't particularly think they're pushing for to win a cup. The supporters obviously would be, but I don't think the club is. I think they recognise their place in this ecosystem, especially as they're a London club. I think they've looked at it and thinking, well, in our catchment area, some of the most talented players from the country have come from that area. So if we can try and make ourselves appealing in that respect, let's do it. I think Forest are in a completely different place. I generally think the attitude of the club is, yes, they want to stay in the division, but they're also thinking, right, let's push on. We want to be doing what Brighton are doing. That's what we want to be doing. 
that's the attitude of the club. You don't go out and spend the money that you you are spending. You don't bring in as many players as you bring in without that. And with that comes a pressure. So I reckon, and I suppose it's more a question for you, looking towards this weekend, are supporters, are Forest supporters expecting them to beat Palace? Are they caught in two minds? Or are they agreeing with me and that's the feeling of like, well, we could win at Palace, but it's difficult for everybody to go there, but we could win there. I think that's how I think every other club in the division treats Crystal Palace. I think difficult place to go, but we could win there. And if we want to do stuff, we should win there. Mm. It's almost a marker of where you are in the Premier League. Can you get something from Selhurst Park? If you mm. can comfortably, then you're a team who are very much in the mix for the the you know the top six or seven. That's that's the question. If you went there and beat Palace, I think I think optimism would be through the roof at Forest. I really do. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't go there expecting to win because, I mean, they're so well organised, aren't they? Like Anderson and Gay here are a really good pairing. Mitchell's really solid. Johnson in goal. Decore is it Decore in midfield? The, mm. I mean, they're very strong through the spine of the team. They're just a bit like us, actually. I don't know if there's enough goals in the team. I think we're very similar to them. So I think a point's a really good result still and just keep that positive momentum going that we've got. I mean, you look at, like you mentioned Brighton, they're always... Uh, I, I think it's unfair to compare teams to Brighton because they're such a shining light. They're so well run. The football's ridiculous. Like every fan who isn't in the top six wants to be Brighton. Uh, do you think Forrest can get to that level? I mean, how long would you take? You think? And is, would you back Cooper to to keep progressing as a coach to be that man to become that elite manager if he isn't already? Well, you'd have to change the way the club is approaching the transfer market. I guess I yeah. wouldn't say. Forrest are going out there and looking for gems. I think they're going out there looking for players who are already recognised as good players. Mm -hmm. That I think that's been their that's been their their attitude in the transfer market. You know, Sangari is a player that a lot of clubs have been looking at. He's not a secret. You know, he's not a player who's gone under the radar or there's issues around whether people um, big teams can sign him particularly. Now, it, it's. It, to ask if people can do what Brian can do, I, the only thing I would say about that is that if you're a club that operates on the purpose of trying to find gems or young players and develop them and sell them for big fees, is there a time, is there a moment where that you just run out of that ability to do that? Yeah. Because like if you keep selling your players, yeah, like Southampton did, if you keep selling your players, your best players, it's, it's difficult. And what Brighton, I think, have done very well is just manage that and also make it difficult for, te for teams to get their players out. But again, that can present a different problem because a player think, why would I move to Brighton if they make it difficult for me to leave? So it's a very difficult balancing act. I think the way Forrest are going at the moment is a good way to go because you're getting good players into the club. But are you, you know, could a Forest fan name their name an 11 they expect to start week in, week out at the moment. I'm sure they have 11 that they want to start, but I I know the sense I get is that there's that difficulty of, you know, the players that got you up, the few that are remaining, do they still have a place in the team? Does Worrell, does Yates, are they still, do they still generally have a place going forward? But, but yet you want them to play because of their commitment to the club and what they've done before. Do you give your new players more of a run in the side if they're pressed but they're not consistent? When you buy, when you bring World Cup winners into the club and they they don't perform very well at all in certain games, yeah. <laughs> you think to yourself, well, hold on a minute, right? So we got this player with this big reputation. Uh, do we play? Do we play him or do we stick to a player who, in the eyes of a lot of people, has rescued his Premier League the way people view him in the Premier League? And Serge Aurier, you know, his performances for Forest have been pretty good mm -hmm. considering the reputation i imagine when he arrived there were a lot of forest fans thinking oh no we've got some washed up goods or however fans want to talk about players but he's impressed so it is a lottery it's never a sure sure thing with with football and the wish of being a brighton you just have to be careful what you wish for because sometimes that can go horribly wrong and you need to have the right people who know how to do that do forest have that system at their club do they have that structure is, it, is there a buy-in from top to bottom to go down that route? That's the big thing. And that's any way that you adapt to football. If you are bringing lots of players in, 
is everybody involved in the process buying into that method of success. And when that happens, you do see clubs do really well. I mean, City, the best example of that. Arsenal are going down that route as well. We've seen it with Brighton. We've seen it with Brentford. Are Forest, can Forest do that? That's the question. Do they have players in that position, uh, people in that position, as in off the pitch, to, to make that all work? Yeah, I mean, what they do have, they've got they've got their recruitment team, who they sacked, and then they bought bought Sirianos back uh, as a consultant, basically. So they've got that camp. They've got the 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 owners camp, who's got really good contacts. He'll throw. Loads, I mean, he got he was behind Navas. He threw loads of money at it. That proved to be a great signing because Dean Henderson was out forever, and now he's out again. And then there's the manager. You know, he want he likes an experienced player. So they've got these three separate camps, and they're kind of a bit too much pick and mix at the moment. It's sort of getting there. I mean, Murillo and Danilo are kind of the prime examples of going down that route of getting younger players with so much potential. What did you? I want. And, and, and of course, and of course. I was, I was going to say they've got they've got a goalkeeper who could have been playing in the Champions League last night and decided yes. to come to Forest and you know and not play. So yes, that's a big part of it. And they've obviously been able to attract players to the club, like Andre Santos as well on loan. A lot of clubs were after him on loan, mm. and he's probably sitting there going, "Am I going to get a look in here?" But the fact that he chose Forest says a lot about what they're offering. And mm. uh, I think that Jesse Jesse Lingard might have started that process. Um, but yes, yeah, yeah. Marilo, first half, you could see that he was an you know as nervous, unsure, um, but he grew into the game, and I think he looked like a player who is the type of player that supporters quite like as a defender. He seemed to almost enjoy the closing stages, you know, being a man down and defending mm. your box. I think Bolly enjoyed that as well. You can, tell, I think, certain defenders in, enjoy that side of the game. I think of Zuma at West Ham as another one of those. They don't like to be. They're not defenders who maybe want to be high up the pitch, defending with a high line and playing out particularly. Now, he might have that in his in his repertoire, but he was nervous with that in the first half. He gave the ball away a fair amount. It was quite notable. Um, and I'm sure Brentford would have played on that, knowing he was making his debut. It was interesting because when the teams came out initially, and sort of we have our inside information about this stuff, but when I first looked at the lineup and first saw the lineup, I thought, is he going to put, Marilo at left back just to maybe, you know, take him out of that central area, perhaps mm -hmm. as, a, as a junior player. But, you know, Neocarte was put there. And I thought that this could be an issue for Forrest in the game. Um, it just, just because these things do unbalance and the opposition notices it and they think, right, okay, this is where we can we can work it. Um, although saying that, I just, I don't, I don't think, uh, I mean, Lewis Potter, tried pretty hard for Brentford in that half, but Bomo didn't have a great game. Um mm. and he was at the end of the game he looked he was quite annoyed. He was he's walking off this pitch talking to himself, you know, not not too happy about his performance and during the game. And he's been one of Brentford's key players. So I don't know whether you look at Forrest dealt with him well or he just had an off day. I, it's hard to say. But uh yeah Murillo I, I don't know if I if my assessment of him is that how Forest fans saw his his game? They were really happy. I think they recognised that he was nervous. I mean, like you, like you guys noted on commentary, I think his first three touches, he gave the ball away. But I think what people liked, and we spoke about his former Forest player, Guy Moussi, was on on Monday, talking about composure on the ball and still trying to make that right pass. And it would have been easy to pump it down the line into the channel. And he didn't do that. And I think if Forest are going to take that next step, they need a centre-half or two centre-halves that are willing to pop it into midfield and and put the ball at risk a lot more than we saw last season. So Forrest would, yeah, fans were really happy with with how he went, certainly, to be fair. It was interesting. I remember Wes Morgan starting as a left-back under Paul Hart, a bit like Murillo, to be out of the way and be this buccaneering, rampaging player. You wouldn't have thought of that um, at Leicester. Just going back to um, Cooper, I mean, obviously Klopp and Guardiola are like the best manager in the league, but Arteta was quite lamented at Arsenal and it was a while where he was on the ropes. I think they finished eighth one season and now he's narrowed the gap. I wonder where, where you would rank Cooper as a Premier League manager and young players have potential and get better. Is he in that bracket as a manager as well? I think he's got the, he's always going to have the issue of, I think in Arteta's case, he was with Pep. You know, this is the, this is the case. So I think in Arsenal's point of view, even they were having a bad run of form, I think there's probably a belief in the Arsenal support that, 
that will just pass on. We'll get there eventually. We'll we'll, we'll, we'll play like that. We'll, we'll we'll be in a position where we can challenge. And it eventually got to that point. Um, whereas Cooper can't, he, you know, he doesn't have that 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 background in the same way. He was also a manager, I think, where, and I think we do this in this country a lot. We don't really pay much attention to youth football at all. Um, mm. And a lot of the other countries on the continent do, and and ones that do well at international have traditionally done well. And I think in the Netherlands and Spain, even in Italy and Germany. And I think it's, it's been a recent thing where it's felt like people have paid more attention to the youth side of, of football. And that's where he's had most of his experience and to, to good effect as well. You know, it's with the Liverpool and then in the England setup. And about three or four years ago now, I did a, a documentary about sort of the young players coming through the English system and everything else. And I interviewed Steve Cooper. And what, what I like about him, he's, 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 he's a very level-headed guy. Mm. And he's, he's, he's a smart man, as in he's very good at... We talk about with Graham Potter, we used to speak about the emotional intelligence thing. And that I think that's such an important thing in football and in life in general. Having the ability, whoever you're speaking to, you adapt slightly to them to make them more comfortable, understand where they're coming from. And that means you can make, can make you a good leader, can also mean you're good as part of a team, especially good when he's dealing with young players as well. And that can be, I think, difficult. And often managers are reluctant to go with young players, maybe because they think that they... They're not going to have that consistency. Maybe they're not to have the maturity to receive the instructions. But he understands all of that. And I think he comes across well in interviews. And last season, the way Forrest started, and I think a lot of people looking outside were expecting him to be sacked, essentially. But I think a lot of that comes from, again, what I was going back to, in that a lot of people maybe didn't know much about him. Didn't know much about him. Didn't know who he was, and just thought, well, Forrest is spending all this money, so they'll just bring in a big name manager, and you know that you know they'll move on from there. That'll be the next process. But I haven't seen much to suggest that they should be anywhere near looking at a new manager, and I say that because I don't, I, I haven't seen much from Cooper to make me think Forrest have got a problem here with the direction they're going in. Because I take it back to what I was saying is. He's, he's certainly never come out and said, I don't like the way this club is you know, being run and I want it like this and I want it like that. I mean, some managers do do that. They do do that. But they, they tend to do that when they're more in a position of strength to, to, to dispute that. He just looked at the situation and I will work with what I'm given. And he always says this sort of stuff. He seems to speak like that. I've been given, he's open about it. He's been given all these players. He's got to give players game time. And hence, you know, chopping and changing, there's always a different player in the lineup here and there. And he wants to settle with it. Will he be given a chance to do that, or will Forrest keep bringing players in? That's the next point because you need to, and we can use Arsenal as a case for that. You need to think, I'm building a team here. I'm building a best eleven, and then a squad beyond that. I want. I'm looking at is Cooper thinking? Go, oh, Matt Turner. He's my goalkeeper for the next two or three seasons. Hard for managers to think that far ahead, but they don't need to if you're going to build a squad. Is this, is this, what's the spine of my team? Who is my first choice centre back? Who am I going to trust to be that, the, 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 the player in midfield, my linchpin for my midfield? And I think they're the sort of key areas because I think forward players, you can chop and change a bit and you can bring new players and you can bring an impact player in. But you build your success from your defence, your goalkeeper, your back four, and, and the, the back of your midfield. City did it. They invested a lot of money in their defenders and their defence is a big part of why they won. When Chelsea won the league title in the past you know, 15 years or so, the defence has been a big part of it. So if Forrest can get that back four or back three or back five settled and you know we can make out that's our defence, then we'll go in place. And I think that's what he'd want to do. And I think he's a manager who's got that ability. He's just unfortunate. It's just the way of life is that people don't trust in it yet because of what's come before at senior level. They understand he won the under-17s, but people will say, well, what does that mean for senior football? I think it actually means a lot for senior football. He's been somewhere and he's won something, you know? Um, he knows what winning is like, what it takes to be in, have a dominant team, which they they were for a period at that level. 
and he's he's experienced that even at youth level he's experienced that and now he's with a club who who are a club who are thinking at the moment they you know they they were battling towards the the bottom end of the league last season but trying to push on from there so he can help them push on there and he's looked to some of those players that he's worked with before to get him involved in he did it at Swansea he's doing it at Forest now there's nothing wrong with that i think that's quite sensible so maybe in the future who knows he might Go and get Smith Rowe from Arsenal or something. Who knows? He might start picking up play Gallagher from Chelsea, and he'll re- he re- he'll rebuild that under seventeen winning team. Yeah, let's rebuild Jaden Sancho. He'll take take him. Yeah, Sancho. Yeah, of course. Yeah, Rian Brewster as well. Yeah, absolutely. There's a few who need some work, uh, but good players. Um, two more topics. Once just before I let you go, one's the City Ground. So much made of it last season. The atmosphere. We've only played um, only, shouldn't really say that about any Premier League club, but, but, but with all due respect, Burnley and Brentford aren't necessarily the biggest draws. We haven't seen quite the same volume and the death spells haven't been quite as loud. But how big a weapon is that still? And how much do you, as a commentator, enjoy working at the City Ground? I just have a love of the older grounds. I just mm-hmm. think the, the fans are closer to the pitch. There's, and I don't know how to say it, there's more of a... Yeah, connection with the fans and the pitch. I look at our like West Ham Stadium and it feels a bit distant. And the fans do work hard, to have worked hard to generate more of an atmosphere there. But you do feel that from the commentary position where the media are, and if you're in one of the upper tiers or anything else, you do feel a long way from the pitch. Forest, <laughs> the city ground, I mean, the commentary position is, and I'm putting this lightly, something of a death trap. Um, <laughs> yes, I know, yeah. <laughs> And uh, some people, a few people, have been injured just trying to get to the commentary position. They've they've made some amends to that. They've put some padding on parts of the gantry and stuff. But you do have to be quite agile. It's a tester of the knees. Uh, and that's that's one of the big tests. But what it does mean when you go to gantries like that, that are hanging those sort of positions, you are in a better position to see the pitch, to feel the atmosphere. And if I could ask for one thing, if they could not play music in the ground before the game, that would be fantastic. In fact, it's a relief when the teams come out and the music's turned off and you just get the crowd noise. That's when I start to feel, oh, that's good. Because before that, you just, you, the, the music is so deafening. Mm. You could be anywhere. Um, is it like that at every ground? It's so Most grounds, the ground. yeah. Oh, it's, it's, the city ground's up there for, for volume. It is yeah. up there for music volume. Um, I, I just, it's actually one of my, you know, if I was doing Room 101 for football, that it would be in there, music in football stadiums. I think I don't mind a track just before the teams come out, maybe, that's a rousing one um, to get everyone excited, know the teams are coming out. But I don't need hype music, you know, half an hour before the game, 10 minutes before, you know, before the game. Music after goals are scored. I know they do that in Germany. That's a big no-no. I don't, oh, yeah, don't get that. Absolutely. I just, I, it's I like think ice hockey, yeah. Oh, I just it's like you're telling supporters what to do in the game. It's like you're telling them now's the time to cheer, now's the time to get excited. Fine for a hype piece of music. During the World Cup, they had one as the teams after the anthems, which work quite well. Um, but yeah, big it's actually one of the hardest things on the day because you're trying to hear the studio and trying to communicate and hear what's going on and build up the atmosphere, and all you're hearing is just some pumping track uh, in your ears. So you know, tiny violin and all of that, but it is, it's a big, big issue. And Forest, Forest don't escape from that. But the ground, as I said, the older grounds, you know, as I said, Villa Park, I know Everton are going to be moving soon. They just, they just have an extra thing about them. Um, and that's even, even Old Trafford, Old Trafford's contribution is excellent. And they tend to, again, have better commentary positions as well. The newer stadiums, you're sometimes you feel like you're a bit further away even Liverpool's new stand you're further away mm. and people might say well, why does that matter I think it matters massively I did Luton against West Ham earlier this season they've got temporary stand in best best position in the league now you're right on the on the pit on the touchline fantastic because you feel part of the game then you feel the fans more and then that impresses on your commentary which is what I'm trying to do is trying to get across excitement of the game if you're a bit detached from it, a bit further away uh it's just not the same 
Uh, let me ask you a commentary question. So uh, hopefully Sky Sports will allow me to play a 20 second clip I've nicked off Twitter. And I hope you don't <laughs> mind hearing yourself back. I know some people would hate that, but I'll play this clip and then I'll ask you about it on either side. You might be able to guess what clip it is, but here we go. I'm thinking three moves ahead whenever something's happening. So you're so somebody's got the ball and thinking, where's everybody else? Who's who's where are people? Where are they? While keeping an eye on on what's who's actually got the ball. I could see Danilo and I could I could see where he was going and I thought. Oh, are they going to get to him? Is it going to get to him? Are they going to get the ball to him? And sometimes things like that happen and it just feels right. I think that's the key of it is that commentary, and this gets often forgotten, is that it's it's a live thing happening. As, as we saw what happened to Darren England at the weekend, in the moment, anything can happen. Anything can happen. You know, writers, football writers get a chance to amend if they make a mistake. When people make videos, they can edit it, everything else. You can even edit a tweet. You can you know, can do a social media post, you can take it down, you can delete it, everything else. Commentary is live and what happens, happens. And what I quite like about it is your feeling at the time is your feeling at the time. You don't get a chance to adjust that, think, well, I could change this or I could do this for, um, this would sound better or everything else. Uh, I just try not to go down that approach. Now, sometimes that might seem it comes across that you're thinking off the top of your head and it could be really random what you're saying, but that is just how it is. I try to make my commentary emotional as much as I can and feel the strength of the game. That's what's good about the City ground. It does lend itself to that when moments are happening. And I would say that game alongside uh, Arsenal-Bournemouth from last season, the two best games are commentated on in terms of what was happening in the game because some people might look at, oh, Forrester playing Southampton towards the back end of the season. Okay, relegation, everything else. Could be a dull game. And it just wasn't because of what was at stake. Forest at that point in time, every single three points felt massive, huge. But then you're facing a team that maybe you're expected to beat. So a lot of the season, you're playing teams, you're thinking, oh, if we could just get something from this, it would be great. Just get something from that. And, you know, facing Brighton and facing City and getting things from games like that, it, it, it's worth something. But when you're playing a team you're expecting to beat, but at the same time, a team that if they beat you, that changes things massively for them as well. It added so much to it, and it felt like that in the ground. There was a sort of sense of nerves. Oh, my gosh, what could happen? What could happen? And and that Danilo goal just felt like a chance for the fans to go, oh, fantastic. Oh, brilliant. We've got a chance to maybe enjoy the next 10 minutes. You see what I mean? And, that, and I think, <laughs> notice I say 10 minutes, <laughs> the next 10, no, yeah, 10 seconds. <laughs> but I think that's that's the best feeling as a supporter is when your team just gets that buffer in a big game, that little bit of a buffer, because you know that even if you concede again, it's not over. You know, you're, you're not despair. It's more the nerves come back then, which is what happens. How they scored again. Mm. And uh, you couldn't escape that, but it just felt with that particular goal. It just felt like the ground went, Oh, thank. Oh, thank for Thankfully, thankfully, you thought I was going to say something else there, weren't you? Uh, so, <laughs> so yeah, that, that's what made it so great. And which is weird because I suppose it's different to say the Arsenal game that I said because that was a last minute winner uh, from a team coming back from a position and and, a t and I think if Arsenal gone on to win the title that would have been one of those almost their Aguero moment would have been that Reese Nelson goal but that wasn't the case. Whereas I think actually for Forest that that moment to me when I look back at that see the back end of the season that felt bigger than Arsenal win over Arsenal it felt bigger than maybe the Brighton game, a point against City, all these sort of things, because of the opposition, you had to win that game. There was no, oh, you know, we're facing a team. If we get a point, that'd be great. You had, you had to win that game. Southampton were looking over the edge of the cliff and you needed the win. And that's why it felt big for him. And as I said, I think I tweeted about it at the time, yet, yeah, you know, if you got an O in the end of your name, you got to stretch it, otherwise, you know, you're wasting your time. What are you there for if you're not going to stretch? <laughs> if you're not going to stretch the, I wasn't giving because there is a with with commentators. If you're an English commentator, you think to yourself, are we allowed that? Are we actually allowed to go full South American? Are we actually allowed to do this? <laughs> and I think to myself, it's tricky because it's not the way of things really traditionally. So I did maybe. I thought I could have gone on for longer, but I thought I'd just stop at the right time. Just when he gets to the fans, the fans are there and let them take over. That's another part of it is trying to give room for it to breathe. 
hear the fans, hear them roar. Because people are watching the games in different positions. Some people, you know, are fortunate enough to have, you know, Dolby surround sound and all these speakers and the, the ultra high definition. Some people are watching it on a knockoff telly, still in SD and everything else. And you don't know how people are watching the game. Sometimes people are watching the game, they can barely hear your commentary through the crowd noise. Some people can hear it too clear for their liking. So I just think you go with your feeling in the moment and that's it. You can't ask for anything else from yourself. No, and we're blessed with commentators around here with Colin Frey and Darren Fletcher, who are both on here, especially Fletcher. Fletcher's on all the time. So, yeah. So you made it up there with them in that echelon in that moment. That season. <laughs> he doesn't get to do many Forest games now, though, does he? That's the thing. Fletch. Yeah. I think he did one. Um, what did he do? I think he did one where we lost or something. It might even be Arsenal away where we were hopeless. I can't remember. But He's yeah. too busy doing Champions League games now, isn't he? Oh, Champions League, NFL. Yeah, I know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, right, we'll leave it there. Um, Fletcher will be with us on Monday, actually. That's the plan. I haven't asked him yet. Uh, but we'll be back tomorrow with uh, the match preview and then obviously back on Monday. And hopefully this Wednesday show is going to become a regular thing after the international break. That's the plan. So hopefully everyone enjoyed that. Do like, comment, subscribe, etc., etc. I'll plug that a lot more on Monday, uh, no doubt. And, uh, so and I, thank I'll, you very much. I will, well, I will say this, Matt. Um, I think I'm yet to see Forest lose, which is the curse of, which is the good to set up that curse. I think I've got them twice over the next month or so in games against Villa and West Ham. So uh, I just thought I'd set that up there, just so you can you can leave that hanging if you do lose those games. <laughs> <laughs> to our lucky charm. I will say just before we go then that because I like to have people who are at games come on. So I asked um, Colin or David Jackson, the radio doctor, to do a lot of our away games last season and they did not have good fortune. I mean, we you know, we were terrible away. <laughs> Even the Blackpool away game in the FA Cup where I thought that would be a banker to talk about a win. We, we lost 4-1. So, yeah, uh, the curse of commentary certainly stunning to radio Absolutely. Nottingham last season. Right, uh, we shall leave it there. Have a good day, everyone, and we shall see you tomorrow.